We're going to go back to Titus this morning, so if you'll turn to Titus chapter 1, we will continue looking at this letter. Paul wants Titus to establish elders and to put in order the things that remain. And so he is wanting the church to be the light that God has designed it to be. This is a passion that the church would radiate and show the world what happens when Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in its midst. So in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, the church is to be this bright light of Jesus Christ. He wants lives that put the gospel of Jesus Christ on display, truth that conforms to godliness. And so Paul has been showing Titus, how do I go about this? Our hearts then should be very attentive. And a day that has just moved into all I want is application. Give me application. Paul is showing us the foundation. How do you get these kind of lives? It's not just application. And where he began is he says, I want you to appoint elders. And the key there, they play a key part that, that they will play in the discipling of believers in the church. And they will be the leaders in the church. And there's a kind of life in verses 5 through 8 that they must manifest of this godliness. And then they are to hold fast in verse 9, the faithful word of God. They're to exhort in sound doctrine day in and day out, in season and out of season. They teach the word of God, and they're there to refute those who contradict this word. This morning, Paul will instruct us then that the elders are to refute those who contradict, that there will be false teachers in the church. Wolves will creep into your midst. This has brought the destruction of many churches. To let false teaching abide and spread through the body of Christ will cause great harm to the church of God. And in our text, it says it will even upset whole households and disrupt them. In Crete, there were many false teachers. The church was under attack just like Jesus said it would be. Just what Paul had warned them, watch out, they will creep in. It was happening just as they had warned and said. Because the devil is wholeheartedly set against the bride of Christ, he never t tires of trying to bring about its destruction. And so God's appointed means of dealing with these kind of teachers is really the, the whole church working together where we are growing in sound doctrine and truth and we can spot the false, but the elders are the ones that God has given authority then to deal with them to deal with them swiftly, truthfully, and strongly if unrepentant. In fact, this whole section this morning, Paul calls us to silence them. He says, Titus, you're to appoint elders and they're to silence these false teachers. We cannot give them a platform to sow their, sow their falsities. We cannot give them authoritative roles in our church. We can't give them opportunities to deceive. They must be silenced. And policing this is the role of the elders and the church. So let's pray to the Lord of the church to protect and purify his bride from teaching that does not conform to godliness, that he would protect us from that and that we would hold fast to the, to the teaching that produces godliness. And as a body, we would be given to that and we would keep sowing it and learning it and growing and being transformed to where we put on display the glory of God in the face of Christ. So let's go to our God. Father, we come before you, and we do. We want to be a church that is exactly what you've designed it to be. God, where we are beholding Christ and being metamorphosed into his image, we're beginning to think and walk like our Savior did upon this earth. God, that we are showing the world something that they can't find anywhere else, what true internal righteousness looks like when it's manifested from the inside to the outside. God, let us be a church in, in a day that is losing a hunger and thirst after righteousness. Let us be a church that hungers for holiness, that hungers for conformity to Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you will give us wisdom to teach this word, but that we would also protect against those who would sow a contradictory gospel, those who would try to lead people away from truth and holy living. God, I pray that you would give us your protection that you would raise up elders who would be strong and bold and loving to protect the sheep against these kind of assaults. God, let us be a whole body committed to keeping a purity here of, for the word of God to be sown in us to grow. So we look to you, God. You alone can do this. Protect 
your church. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Titus chapter 1. As we've been studying through, we just finished verse 9 the last time we were together in Titus. And this morning, we're going to look at verses 10 through 16 of chapter 1. Look with me in verse 10. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things that they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. The way we're going to look at this this morning is a few couple points. The first point we're going to look at is that Paul gives a description of who these men or women are. And so I want us to begin just by a picture of what do they look like? How do we spot them? What are they going to talk like, think like? What are they going to teach And so let's look at the description of these false teachers that Paul is warning about. The first point in verse 10, I just want you to notice the number of them. Paul says there are many. There are many of these false teachers on the island of Crete. And I don't know about you, but that word bothers me. I kind of expected there's one. There might be a couple on a little small island. There are many. There are many on the island of Crete, a handful of them. There are many that need to be silenced. I wonder how many people in the city of Denver need to be silenced if there's that many on the island of Crete. Listen to 1 Timothy 4. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith. So in these end times, people are going to be falling away from the faith. And they're going to be paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who, here's what they're teaching, they forbid marriage. They advocate it's abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. You can eat unorganic food, that's saying right there. (laughs) For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the means of the word and prayer. And one other verse to set our context in 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Peter says, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. They won't put on godliness. The truth will be maligned because of their lives. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So guys, the enemy will always be seeking to sow his destructive heresies to the church. And he will have many messengers And some of them will be deceived and they won't even know they're doing it. And some will come in and they'll be malicious and they'll be deliberate about what they're doing. And so our description of false teachers, our second one, there'll be many of them. But also in verse 10, Paul kind of gives a description of their behavior. For there are many that they're rebellious. Uh, They're rebellious to Jesus and they're rebellious to his word. And they're just insubordinate to authority. It means to be unruly and out of control. They won't respond to the elders. They won't respond to the scriptures. I had a man who went through a training institute in a church that I used to be a part of. And now he's pastors a church that has become very deviant and very cultish. And he will not listen to any of his mentors. He won't listen to any other teachers. He won't reason with scripture. He's just become rebellious. And that's what Paul says is when they just get rebellious and they won't listen to anyone any longer. So when you meet a false teacher, they're almost always rebellious to those who had authority over them. They don't want authority. 
One of the characteristic sins that we've seen just in Timothy that I just, or in Peter that I just read is it's very common that they're immoral, adultery. I've seen more pastors who fall in adultery, and the first thing they do is they flee their church and say, I don't like the way the elders are dealing with me, and they leave. It's a constant thread. I don't want authority in my life. People who teach error bolt from true authority, and so they're rebellious. Secondly, they're empty talkers. That word means smooth, fluent, persuasive. Yet this word also means they have nothing to say. It's not the truth of God's Word. They're smooth, fluent. They speak a lot, but they have nothing to say truly about God's Word. It's always twisted. There's some truth, but it becomes a complete untruth by the way that they are teaching it. They will quote Scripture out of context, and they will use it maliciously. Christian bookstores are filled with this stuff. Our radios are filled with this stuff. And God says here by Paul through to Titus, they need to be silenced. They must be silenced. They're also deceivers in verse 10. They're seducers of people's minds. They manipulate them. Timothy says in the end days they'll turn aside to myths. That Greek word was fanciful stories. They'll, they'll turn aside to hearing fancy stories and they'll be deceived and they'll be manipulated and twisted. In Crete, there was a group of these teachers made up of Jews. He says in verse 10, uh, especially those of the circumcision. And your notes later, just Galatians 2, 7 through 12, I believe that's talking about this circumcision sect that had come into Christianity. And they would say, we are Christians, we've come to faith, but you have to be circumcised to really be saved. You, you need to be circumcised to be brought into the promise of Abraham. And so they said, also, you have to keep some mosaic ceremonial law with cleansings and different rules. That's the only way that you can really be saved. So Christ plus circumcision, Christ plus ceremonial law equals salvation. And so they needed to be silenced. Anathema, Paul declared in Galatians. In Titus 1.16, they profess to know God. We know God even better than you. And they're coming in saying, you, you can know God as deeply as me. You need this plus add this on to the gospel. In verse 14, it says they were paying attention to Jewish myths, myths that they were coming from the Old Testament. And it was a form of Gnosticism of the day that, again, we know God better than anyone else. And the teachers come, if you really want to know God like me, so they're always putting themselves up. I know God better. Come learn from me, and you'll be able to know God the great way that I do. Have you ever seen those little secret decoder rings when you're a kid? They probably don't have them anymore. I have the secret decoder ring so that you can see and understand Scripture. The church in Crete is being told that they can climb up to their level of knowing God. I get it, and no one else does. These men had gotten into some teaching platforms, and they were deceiving many. And it appears that it wasn't even so much from the pulpit, but more in private. In verse 11, they were upsetting whole families. And so one thing they like to do is they like to get you in isolation. They, they, they like to pull you from the church, which is your protection and your means of growth that God has given to you, the body of Christ, and they like to get you away from it, and then they'll sow and teach you their false teachings. The false teacher has to get you alone to sow his wares. There's no one else to help you like in a Sunday school class where you have other discerning believers there to say no or to correct. They like to come to your door. Would you like to have a Bible study in your home? Paul said they enter into households and captivate weak women. They sit in front of the TV and you just soak up their air all day long. Well, what is the motive? Why would someone do this? Well, I think there are several in scriptures. There's pride for sure, the appearance, they like approval, they, they love authority. But what Paul tells us here, why they do it uh, in verse 10 uh, verse 11, actually, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not for the sake of sordid gain. So it's interesting. Remember what the elders, the qualifications earlier, one of the qualifications was they're not fond of sordid gain. And now we come to the false teacher, and they are, they're very fond of sordid gain. It's interesting that the elder is, is not fond of it, and these, it's opposite for the false teacher. They're in it for the money. 
If there's no money, you will see false teachers will quit. Oh, I'm led to the next place. I'm going to move on. God's called me to something else. 1 Timothy 3, he says the elder is to be free from the love of money. And these false teachers are characterized by a love of sordid gain and money and the like. Look with me in verse 12 and 13. He's going to give us a picture of their character. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This is a quote from one of their very poets. Uh, I'm trying to say his name, but I'm going to butcher it so bad. Epimetudes? That's probably not even close. He was ranked one of the seven wisest men in all of Greece. And so he, he was a famous one, and he's from there. He's a hero of this town. And he wrote this, Cretans are always liars and evil beasts and lazy gluttons. It's funny, the Greek word, kretso, from crete, is the verb to lie. So they, they, they were so known for their lying, there's actually a verb in the Greek that comes from this very city. Kretso, you're a liar. They're characterized by, by lying. I remember John MacArthur said, if, if everyone in America one day told the truth, our whole country would break. The whole country is built on lies and deception. And that's really what was going on in Crete. They were characterized by lying. They were self-indulgent. They were overindulged gluttons and sensual passions. These types are hanging around the church and they're propagating lies. The culture is now bearing down upon the church. That's what's going on in Crete. So Cretans are liars and gluttons, and now it's coming in to the church, and you've got teachers sowing teaching that isn't correcting that behavior. And that is why you need to appoint elders, Paul says, to have lives that will contradict these false teachers who are gluttons and all the things that they're doing. We need lives that will show different. We need someone who will hold to this faithful word and sow truth into the church to refute and silence these false teachers. And so the culture is seeking to permeate into our church where truth today, they say it's not absolute. We're told that you can't stand against anything without being judgmental as the air we breathe. You have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. You don't because you're under grace. And, and there's just lies after lies in our culture that are permeating. And, and so we've got to shut this down. We've got to fight it. The false teachers are among us. They must be silenced into our own minds and hearts. And so that leads me to our next point. There is a description of these false teachers. And so the second point is what should be our reaction to these false teachers? How should we deal with them? Look with me in verse 13. This testimony is true about what the Cretans are. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Reprove them severely. 2 Timothy 4, in the last days they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll want to have their ears tickled with these kind of teachers. Paul says, reprove and rebuke them with great patience and instruction. Reprove them. Rebuke them. Patience and keep instructing in this sound word. Show them where their doctrine is off. Tell them that it is wrong. Help them see it. Spend time. Get with them. Listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. Do it with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive to do his work will. So there appears to be kind of a progression in how we deal with these false teachers. Titus 3.9 says this in a few chapters, but shun foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they're unprofitable and worthless. These people debating on all those things, and, and he's, he says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Give them a warning. And if they won't turn and stop, he says, you reject them. I have nothing to do with them. And we have other scriptures that will guide us and lead us in this. And so the progression I see throughout the scriptures is we go to someone who's teaching something false. We try to help them see where they're off. We're going to have great gentleness and we're going to help them and work through it and talk and study together. If they won't listen, if they won't be corrected and they keep teaching it, there comes a safety to the church of God. 
where Paul says we must silence them. Reprove them, but Paul uses a word here, severely. It means to cut off. It was used of cutting off branches. Reprove them severely. Get their false deceptions away from the sheep and the body of Christ. Reject a factious man. Treat him as a Gentile and an unbeliever in Matthew 18 when they will not repent. So when the elders have to warn you about a divisive man, it's for your good and your safety. I've only had to do it one time in 18 years. And, and when you're warned about it, I, I had to do it once, and several families would not take the heed, and they have been hurt since. And so I want you, when, when we have to silence a false teacher that is destructive and dangerous as a body, we need to take heed and be one and protect that from being sown in our body. We need to silence them according to Titus. And so, guys, it's not safe to sit under false teachers. Do not give yourself a diet of false teaching. Do not listen to them. And look with me then in verse 14. Not paying attention to Jewish myths and the commandments of men who turn away from the truth. So Paul describes a little bit of some other false teaching in this passage. So don't pay attention then they're coming to their Jewish myths. And this was very common of their day. The teachers of the Old Testament were interpreting it with an extreme allegory. And they were mystical and they were fanciful interpretations. And I learned an, an example this week in my studies of something outlandish. And so I just want to give you an example so you know what we're talking about. They said, these teachers said, if you take the name of Abraham and you drop out all the vowels, there's only three remaining consonants. And if you take a numerical value, which they could assign in those days, of those three numbers, it would be 318. And that means that Abraham means 318 servants of the Lord. This form of teaching elevates them above everyone else because whoever read Abraham and got that out of it? I've studied a long time in my life and I've never got that. And you can say now, well, now I need a special teacher because they can see things that I'll never see just reading this scripture on my own. And so I need these guys and that's what they want. They, they want you to become so dependent on their special abilities and what they can see in the word and what they can discern. Again, they need the secret decoder ring. I had a guy that I knew every Sunday when he preached, he would say every week, all the commentators got it wrong. This is what it really means. And sometimes all the commentators might get it wrong, but every week. And so what happened was, is, man, you're better than all the commentators. I'll never be able to understand it without you. I need you to interpret everything and just a steady line to his office for counseling. So they're doing all kinds of hermeneutical gymnastics here with the Old Testament. Stories about mystical characters and the like are being sown. And they're teaching in verse 14, commandments of men who turn away from the truth. They come up with all of their different rules and the things that you have to do to be a Christian. You've got to have this. You've got to have that. The Pharisees were our best examples of this, and we just studied that in the Sermon on the Mount. It was all the externals and not the internal. So false teachers very commonly will start saying everyone has to dress this way, look this way, talk this way, and you get very caught up in the externals, and you turn away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and Him alone. Salvation in Jesus Christ alone and in sanctification in Jesus Christ alone. And you will get led astray and you will be led to yourself, your own efforts, your own flesh, your own strength to make yourself saved or holy. You will get lost in all of these man-made things. You'll just die under it. And you'll turn away from the truth that is in Jesus Christ of the souls that we just heard. When you will look to Him alone, He will save the sinner who believes upon Him. Some of the things, I've watched a lot of things. One of the things about getting older is there's things now that you've learned. And I've, I've watched, what we're looking here is, it's easy to say, oh, I would never fall for that. But I just want to give you some things that I've seen come into the church and actually disrupt the faith of many. Because it's, all of them, I think, are going to be true. But when they're in isolation, they're not. And the first one that I learned early on was that um, demand feeding is if you don't schedule your babies when they're born to eat, you're in sin. Demand feeding is sin. And it started all this conflict and division. 
I've witnessed division between whether you homeschool or send your kids out to school. I've seen this, these, these financial planning things that unless you do it the way this guy teaches it, it's sin, and that isn't going to work. I've seen birth control become the issue. Organic food, natural baby bearing. If you use an epidural, you're in sin. Modesty, when all of a sudden now I've got a vision from God, of, I can tell you exactly what it means. Uh, from dress length to anything, I'll, I will give you a definition. Courtship versus dating. I kissed dating goodbye, and there became a whole cult following, and there was only one way to do this thing, and the church started fighting and dividing over whether you could ask a girl on a date or if you had to court her. Medical doctors versus homeopaths. Which version of the Bible you could read? I preached in a pulpit where unless I used King James, they wouldn't let me in the pulpit. They're out there. They're out there, and you may sit here this morning and be in one of them. And I want my kind and gentle rebuke to turn you back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we get on the gospel, and that begins to sanctify, transform, and change. And you can have a commitment on everything I just said, but if you lose the gospel and make that the gospel, you will hurt yourself greatly. Thirdly, the evaluations of the ones then to be silenced. This is kind of God's evaluation, verse 15. He's going to show inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly in verse 15. In the Old Testament, if you touched things, you were defiled. If you touched a dead corpse, you were defiled. All these cleaning systems. If you touched a leper, there were things that you had to do to be cleansed. So the thought was that the outside makes you defiled on the inside. And Jesus comes on the scene and the Pharisees are beside themselves that Jesus doesn't ceremonially clean himself the way he should before he'd eat or heal somebody or whatever it is. And they're just going crazy that he's not doing the external things that he should. And he tells them this, it's not what comes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him that defiles a man. For out of the heart comes adulteries and lyings and thieveries. And so it's the heart is the issue that needs to be saved. And so it's from within the heart that the outernals flow. And so whenever you're told it's the externals that will pollute the internals, you've missed it. From the inside is where it flows. And so if you are pure, he says in verse 15, to the pure, all things are pure. Inside is the true issue of Christianity. And false teachers will always deal with the outside. But if your insides are rotten, you'll just make everything that you touch defiled. Your life and your teaching and your external things will not take care of the real problem of the gospel of Jesus Christ that gets into the heart and changes from the inside to the out. False teachers love the external issues, and if their conscience is defiled, the Scripture says here they can't even make a true judgment in truth. And inwardly, in verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. So they, we know God, and you can know Him deeper like us, but by their very lives they deny Him. They're detestable, they're disobedient, and they're worthless for any good deed. There's nothing they can do. They can't help you, they can't lead you, they can't guide you. So they profess to know God, but their very lives show that they don't. And I think all of us should look at our own lives and say, do I profess to know God, but my very life shows that I don't, and that the false teachers will come, and that's the kind of lives that they'll have, and their teaching will produce that. They need to be silenced. They need to be reproved so that they may be sound in the faith, and this is our whole goal, to be sound in the faith, to, to know the truth and to be sound in it so that your life will give forth the light and the truth of who God is and what He's doing. And so we, we want to be sound in the faith. We want to be reproved and we want to be hungry and be men and women and girls and boys who are studying to be sound in the faith so that it will be that that produces godliness in our lives. And so we have some sitting here this morning that we want to teach and correct and reprove so that they will become sound in the faith and the gospel will sound forth from this building. And so that's the commitment. And where this is going to go in Titus 2 is so beautiful. But I just, this is so important. I can't tell you how, how important to the church. I was just studying this week, and I want to just have
have you listen to about three, the lives of three people that really touched me and why this could be so important in our church, because I think it plays out on a daily basis in our churches. There are three people, Joe, Charles, and Mary. <coughs> Excuse me, Joe was born in Vermont, and he later moved to upstate New York, and his family came to America in 1638, and he was just a really good kid, and he got a job at a young age to help his families, and I just want all you kids to listen to that. I think that's very important, to get a job and help your family. Uh, he became a Presbyterian, and some of his other family went th- to the Methodists, and at the age of 16, he was done with Christianity. He just felt that the churches weren't true, and he just wasn't getting anywhere with it, and so he really left the church completely. Charles was a hardworking young lad that grew up in Pennsylvania, and he was a Presbyterian as well, and he later went and joined the Congregationalists. And he too, at the exact same age of 16, he ended up leaving the church for very much the same reasons. And there was this girl named Mary who was born in New Hampshire. She was a devout Congregationalist. At 17, she joined the church, and she was, it said she was a very spiritual young lady. Really, her whole life, there was a deep desire for the spiritual. But she, too, drifted from the church, and she ended up leaving it. And we just keep seeing that happen by the droves in our day and age. These three are just sad stories to me when I see so many doing the same thing. I, I just wonder, this just causes me to think, if, if an elder or an older woman or an older man would have met these three and, and, and poured into them and led them into the truth if they didn't have the gospel, of course, and then discipled them and maybe talked through some of their ideas. What are you struggling with? What, what are you thinking? And we could guide them and show them where they were off, teach them, rebuke them, correct them. But it, none of that happened from the best we know. Well, the rest of the story of these three is that Joe was Joseph Smith And Joseph Smith became the founder of Mormonism, and he has led millions and millions and millions of people away from the truth of of the gospel. Charles was Charles Russell, who became the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and he has led millions and millions away from the truth of this gospel. And Mary was Mary Aker Betty, Mary Baker Eddy, who was the founder of Christian Science as well, and has brought great destruction on all who follow it. They left the churches. And so have millions and millions of people who have followed suit with this stuff. I want to be faithful to do church the way that God has instructed us. To put the things in order that remain. To be a church that teaches sound doctrine in a day when it's not popular. And it reproves those who contradict in an age where we are not to reprove anything. That none of you wander into error and into the destruction of your souls. That the blood of others should be on your head by your false teaching. And so, guys, we, we protect and we preach this gospel. We build each other up in this most holy word. That's what goes on throughout the life of this church. We build each other up on this gospel. These new baptisms that we heard today, to build on that foundation and to get into their lives and love them and shepherd them and help them and guide them into fruition and maturity. The beauty of why these ones must be silenced then is so that the gospel will remain pure and undefiled, so that we can be changed and transformed and grow into godliness. We've got to protect this and keep it pure in this church. And as we give ourselves to it together in community, we're going to be built up into our most holy head, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you keep this gospel pure and give your lives to each other, we're going to begin to be built up and look like the head of this church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us elders who will seek peace and who who will not seek peace in the church at all cost. But the peace that comes through the truth and the gospel and those who will drift and astray and they will not turn, we will reprove them severely. For the grace of And wisdom, then I pray, to carry this out at Southside Bible Church. And for our future elders in training, I want you to be kind and gentle and patient and instructing and in correcting. But I want you to be men who are strong in the protection of your churches against anything that seeks to distort the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want cowards.
I want men who treasure this gospel and you sow it and you're patient and you're kind. But when this gospel is being perverted and twisted and they won't turn, that you'll die for that and be those kind of men who are willing to stand at any cost for this gospel. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the once for all delivered gospel of Jesus Christ to us. I thank you for this truth of the word of God. Lord, I thank you that it conforms to godliness. It joins us to Jesus and it conforms us to Jesus. I thank you by your grace that you have brought us into Christ. Lord, I love that place. I love dwelling and being with him and enjoying and delighting and being empowered by my Savior. God, I pray that we would be committed to this gospel. I pray that we'd be men and women and children who want to learn it from every angle. God, that we give ourselves to it so that, that the way you can spot the false is by knowing the truth. And so I pray, let us keep growing in, in the discernment and treasuring this gospel. And let us be faithful then when we see deviant teaching from it. God, let us love each other and correct each other in it and be those who open our Bibles and have good discussions and, and look into the Word. But God, when there are those who will not turn from false teaching, would you give us your grace and your authority to reprove them severely and to protect the body of Christ from the dangers that would be sown into it. And I thank you for the purity of what you've done in this body where there's a pure gospel and it's treasured and loved and believed. And I thank you for the, the three that just entered in today through baptism, God, of wanting to join the church and be those who now will be built up in this way. I thank you that, that the church is the place where you birth and sanctify and bring us to glory. God, the gates of hell will never overcome it. And so we thank you for this. And I thank you for this morning. Let us be sober and let us rejoice, God, in the gospel that you have given to us. We love it, we believe it, and we treasure it. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.